Hi everybody, this is Mrs. Malloy and this is lecture number one for unit six. All revolutions display a pattern. Case example, the French Revolution. All right, let's get started. Do all revolutions in history display a pattern? Well, yes, I believe they do. And in my humble opinion, the French Revolution is a classic example of such a pattern. All revolutions, no matter how big or how small, possess certain characteristics. Some of these are political, some of these are economic in nature, and some of these deal with certain social phenomena. So yes, I believe that all revolutions share certain political, social, and economic factors. So today I will first discuss the characteristics of all revolutions and then explain how these apply to perhaps the most famous revolution in history, the French Revolution. And please note this is the largest, or the longest at least, lecture for this unit, so don't be afraid. We just have a lot to explain to get started, and then my subsequent lectures for the unit of the six I'll be doing are going to be much, much shorter. Okay, so first of all, the term revolution is used to describe any monumental or significant change in history. History is full of people who want to rock the boat and create lasting change. You know, maybe you'll be one of those people one day, and I certainly hope that for each of you. Revolutionary changes can be specific events, like the French Revolution, or they can be related to and reflected in technological and philosophical advances. So here are the primary characteristics, I believe, of any revolution in history. G-E-N-O-S. G-E-N-O-S. Genos. Genos, your genos, bada bing. Okay, I'll stop. But yeah, write down that acronym in your notes, please. G E N O S. Genos. And now I'll, I'll explain in more detail. So, first and foremost, the G. The G stands for government problems. You know, any country that has experienced a revolution will have issues within the current government that will help to create circumstances or the need for a major change. Secondly, the E in Genos is economic problems. Um, most countries that have revolutions have some sort of economic difficulties or economic inequality that fosters sort of this uh, the situation for, for much change to take place. So we'll talk in more detail about that today as well. All right, the N in Genos, new social ideas and philosophies sort of like all those philosophies we just learned about from the Enlightenment. You know, people start to question traditional ideas and these new ideas lead to different philosophies about how government should be run, how economic practices should take place. Um, so we'll talk about those things as well. All right, the O in Genos, other revolutions that inspire uh, the current revolution or ongoing revolutionary periods once an initial revolution has already taken place like sort of like a period of craziness or anarchy or period in which people argue over what type of new government should be established or even a period of violence. And finally, S, which stands for social inequality. Social inequality means that there are some fundamental differences between different people on the social strata, but more on that later. Okay, it's later. So now you can't claim or make a superlative statement saying that Mrs. Malloy never talks about things later. Ha ha. All right, so basically when you have social inequality, you're going to see a social hierarchy of some sort in which some groups of people have more privileges than others. And this is going to lead to people on the bottom naturally demanding more political, economic, or social rights. So G-E-N-O-S, genos. All revolutions in this unit will reflect genos. G-E-N-O-S. So the French Revolution is one of the most well-known revolutions in the history of mankind. Does the French Revolution reflect genos? Why, yes, it does. There were many reasons for the French Revolution, so let's look at these using genos to help us. Reasons for the French Revolution. G, government problems in France. You know, they had an absolute monarch. It had a, an absolute monarch for a long time. <laughs> Remember that quintessential absolute monarch named Louis XIV? 
Yeah, the Sun King who built Versailles. Well, by 1789, the people in France, they'd had it with absolute monarchy. Under absolute monarchs in France, people's natural rights were being denied, and people felt that they had no say in government. The king in power in France in 1789 was a guy named Louis XVI. His wife was Marie Antoinette. People were really dissatisfied with their government. All right, E, economic problems in France. France was almost bankrupt by 1789. King Louis XVI and his wife Marie Antoinette, they maintained a very expensive lifestyle at their court at Versailles, the castle. France also had gone into a lot of debt in order to fight their arch rival, England, in war after war, including a little, little conflict called uh, the American Revolution. France was basically spending more money than it was bringing in. And when you're, not, when you're not bringing in as much money as you're spending, well, it doesn't take an astrophysicist to figure out what's going to happen. Because France was so in debt, the government continuously taxed its population. And the tax set up in France at the time you know, had people who were the least able to support the nation paying all of the taxes. The richest members of society were pretty much living tax-free. What? Yeah. Well, that brings me to the N of Genos, which is N, New Social Ideas and Philosophies. Many people in France were inspired by ideas from the Enlightenment period in Europe. Ideas like John Locke's theory of natural rights, which held that, you know, if your current government wasn't respecting your natural rights, have a revolution and put a different government in its place, preferably one that will respect your natural rights. Other notable philosophers who inspired the French Revolution included Montesquieu, who came up with the idea of separation of powers via three separate branches of government, and Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who believed that people agree to give up certain rights in society for the benefit of the whole, for a broader good, like the speed limit thing, remember? All right, and finally, let's get to the final two. Oh, other revolutions helped to inspire the French Revolution. Most notably, the American Revolution. But there are two parts to this other category, okay? So the other revolution category, there are really two parts to this. First was the whole American Revolution inspiration. You know, French people realized, hey, if they can get rid of their king, why can't we? But the second part of the other revolution category includes a very revolutionary transition period. All countries that undergo a revolution have some sort of transitional period in which much change takes place. For the French Revolution, this occurred in several stages, which I will discuss shortly when I talk about the various stages of the French Revolution, and that'll be the longest part of my lecture. All right, and finally, S in Genos for France, uh, social inequality. In France, society was divided into a social hierarchy, which is to say that it was divided into three primary social classes called estates. The first estate was the clergy. The second estate was composed of the nobles, and the third estate was everyone else. Both the first and second estates enjoyed special privileges in society and were not required to pay taxes. The third estate, or 97% of the population, included poor peasants, but also a rising middle class of people and upper middle class people, including doctors, lawyers, and rich business people. The bulk of the tax burden fell almost entirely on the backs of the third estate, and especially the middle and upper classes. So, genos applies to the French Revolution. Okay, but now I'd like to get into the actual stages of the revolution to continue from the O category of genos, remember? So let's take a look at how the French Revolution unfurled, shall we? And remember, you're probably not going to be able to fit everything that I say down on this piece of paper, so feel free to add your own notes on separate sheets of paper. Okay, so let's talk um, about the stages of the French Revolution. Okay, the first stage of the revolution, write down the National Assembly. Great. So, you know, once it seemed clear that people wanted to revolt, Louis XVI, their king, decided to allow France's parliament to convene or to meet. The French parliament was called the Estates General, remember? And, you know, they hadn't met since the early 1600s. So when Louis XVI called them into session, this was a big deal. The problem was that because each estate was given one vote, the first and second estates could always outvote the third estate. So under the writing and leadership of a famous third estate delegate named Emmanuel Joseph Sies, the third estate broke apart from the two other estates and they declared themselves the real voice of France. 
and they called themselves the National Assembly. The National Assembly decided to end the absolute monarchy and start a representative democracy. Well, obviously the first and second estates, as well as Louis XVI, didn't really like this decision, and they were locked out of the estate's general meeting place. So what did the third estate delegates do? They met on an indoor tennis court instead and pledged to write a constitution for France. This became known as the Tennis Court Oath. Second, okay, the second stage of the French Revolution, what was the second event of it? It was the storming of the Bastille. Okay, don't freak out. Weird French word, right? Okay, my Francophile friends, Americans pronounce this word as Bastille. Please refer to your vocabulary list. French people pronounce it Bastille. So, you know, I happen to like saying Bastille because I speak a little French, so don't get confused. Mrs. Malloy also calls uh, Clementine tangerines Clementines. Again, it's just a pronunciation thing. Good thing the town of Charlotte here in Rochester is called Charlotte, right? And not Charlotte. Ooh, do you think it's a French word? Ooh, yeah, French influence in upstate New York. Who knew? Okay, so more on all that in American history in 11th grade, okay? So the second event for the French Revolution was the storming of the Bastille. The Bastille was a, a prison in Paris. A mob attacked this prison on July 14, 1789, killing some of the guards as well as the prison commander, whose heads were then put on long sticks called pikes and paraded around the city. That sounds pretty grotesque. There weren't any prisoners at the Bastille, but you know there was a fairly good-sized arms cache, which the mob stole. This attack on the prison became an important symbol for the French people, and today, July 14, is Bastille Day in France, or Independence Day. It also happens to be one of my daughter's birthdays. So, joyeux anniversaire, Chloe, ma grande, je t'aime, et c'est pourquoi tu as un prénom français, ma belle. Bisous, toujours. Right, sorry for that digression, but it was absolutely necessary. A little shout out to my daughter. Right, so the storming of the Bastille on July 14th marks French Independence Day, even today. All right, the third stage of the French Revolution. Number three, right, so the final event that's going to start the whole Fr uh, French Revolution and start all these stages was actually not a single event. Rather, it was a series of scary events referred to as the Great Fear. Basically, peasants went vigilante, arming themselves. <laughs> there appeared to be complete disregard for law and order at that time. Peasants broke into rich people's homes and murdered whole families. It was a scary time in France to be a member of the first or second estate or even to be perceived as rich. Lots of people were murdered, and this became collectively known as a period of senseless ma uh, panic and fear called the Great Fear. A large mob of mostly peasant women marched from Paris to Versailles, where the king and queen lived. They broke into the palace, and then they arrested the king and queen, forcing them back to Paris. Okay. So, you know, we've been talking about these events of the French Revolution, and it sounds like so far we're up to the point where They've arrested their king and queen. Right. So, you know, that great fear was a scary time in France. Okay, uh, The peasants are going to go around killing members of that first and second estate or anyone who was perceived as rich. It started to get pretty out of control. And this is really indicative of any place that has gone through a revolution. You have a period of disorder. Certainly this was true of the French Revolution. All right, so the members of the newly formed French government called the National Assembly, they held an emergency meeting to get things under control. The National Assembly enacted many changes. First, they got rid of the estate system. They abolished it, or you know that traditional social hierarchy in France making everyone equal in society. Second, they're going to write a constitution called the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of Citizen. This document is very similar to the American Declaration of Independence. The Declaration of the Rights of Man guaranteed people rights that they'd previously not enjoyed under the Ancien Regime, or Old Regime, in other words, the absolute monarchy. The National Assembly also adopted the motto, Liberty, Equality, Fraternity, which is the French national motto even today. <laughs> now I know what you're thinking. Okay, now folks, fraternity here means brotherhood. It does not mean like, no dude, frat party. No, it means brotherhood. It comes from the, word, the Latin word fraternus, meaning brotherhood. A famous women's rights activist named Olympe de Gouges, she's on your word list, she wrote a constitution that included rights for women, 
and she most likely inspired women around the globe to demand inclusion in government documents, sort of like Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton later on, and their whole Declaration of the Rights of Women of the United States, which they published, by the way, hello, upstate New York, just saying, you should probably remember that. Anyway, Olympe de Gouges um, was a feminist for her time, and she was actually declared an enemy of the state during the revolution later on, and she was executed. So, yeah, ladies, enjoy those rights, yo. All right, the third thing the National Assembly did, they nationalized or took over control over the Catholic Church, creating a state-controlled church. So the Catholic Church is going to lose land and political power in France. This act actually really angered the peasants at first, who were really devout Catholics. So um, what we're going to start to see during the French Revolution is a split in the revolutionaries and what they believed was the best way to go about their revolution. You know, meanwhile, while all this was happening, Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette, they tried to escape from France in the middle of the night. They snuck out of their residence in Paris. They tried to leave. Unfortunately, they were recognized at the border and returned to Paris to stand trial and placed under house arrest. Okay, so by 1791, France had a new constitution with a limited monarchy. Yeah, still wanted a king, but one that was limited in power, sort of like in England, remember? They also had a new legislative body in France called the Legislative Assembly. The problem? Well, not everyone wanted a limited monarchy, and pretty soon people in the new government divided themselves into several factions or groups within the Legislative Assembly. Remember, this is another thing um, represented in all revolutions in history. You've got people starting to argue whenever they've had their initial revolution. There's always going to be this other subsequent period where people start to argue about what changes to implement following their revolution. You know, each group in France had a different idea about how government should be led. And this is going to result in a lot of bloodshed, unfortunately. There were three main groups, radicals or extremists, there were moderates and conservatives. They all sat together in their respective groups in the assembly hall, radicals on the left, moderates in the middle, and the conservatives on the right. These divisions actually are still used even today in politics to describe people's political beliefs on the political spectrum. Radicals are considered left-wing, moderates are in the center, and right-wing people tend to be more conservative and want fewer changes. In France, the radicals wanted complete change, and they wanted to kill the king immediately. The moderates were somewhere in between in their beliefs or undecided, and the conservatives in France wanted a constitutional monarchy. They still wanted to have a king. In the general public, outside of the new government, peasants and other people had aligned themselves in different groups as well. There were nobles and people who had fled France at the beginning of the revolution and during the Great Fear. They were called émigrés. These people wanted things to go back to the way they had been before the French Revolution. There were also poor peasants who were complete vigilantes who wanted to take power in their own hands as citizens of France. These lower class radicals were often called sans culottes because of the short pants they wore designating them as lower class. You know, upper class men at that time had long pants styles, but the um, lower class guys had shorter pants like culottes. Not culottes, but capris. There you go. With so many groups fighting over who would control government and so many citizens taking the law into their own hands, France looked like it was out of control. In fact, a lot of absolute monarchs in countries like Prussia and Austria, they were freaked out that the revolution and, uh, might spread to their own countries. So, you know, France went to war with Austria and Prussia in 1792. There were mobs of people during this war period who continued to look for monarch sympathizers around France, and these mobs would execute the people on the spot. In fact, these executions, or several executions in September of 1792, became known as the September Massacres. Things were really getting out of control during this revolutionary period in France following their initial revolution. A new government was going to be formed in 1791 called the National Convention. It officially replaced the constitutional monarchy and made France a democratic republic. A radical group of people were called the Jacobins, uh, and that looks like Jacob. Jacobins, and it's spelled like Jacob Inns, but it's pronounced in French Jacobin. <laughs> so the Jacobin took power in 1792. Notable Jacobin leaders included uh, Georges Danton, or Danton, and a newspaper publisher named Jean Paul Marat. Marat was actually murdered in his own bathtub by a peasant woman, an activist named Charlotte Corday, who was a member of a rival political group. 
Can you imagine? Wow. So the Jacobin National Convention government was super extremist or super radical. They sentenced Louis XVI to death and he was beheaded with a new device called the guillotine in, so in January of 1793. The following period became known as the Reign of Terror and France is going to end up with a dictator named Maximilien Robespierre. Wow. So they went from having an absolute monarch had this huge revolution and an unstable period, and they're going to end up with a dictator named Maximilien Robespierre. I wonder how they got rid of him, and I wonder how they ended up with that guy Napoleon. Hmm. All right, so just to sum, up, sum everything up, remember Genos. Genos for France. Government problems, economic problems, new ideas, other revolutions and revolutionary activities, and finally, social inequality. The French Revolution is only going to end when a guy named Napoleon Bonaparte takes over. But that, my friends, is the topic of our next lecture. So thanks for listening. And again, this was the longest one, so thanks for listening. Bye.